Well, when they're saying we didn't see what we saw, in yeah. all the pictures you have of it, and the thousands of GIs that saw it, I don't know how anybody can say it didn't happen. We turned down this dirt road and we went down and I saw this big fence uh, with a big high fence with uh, what like we call our cattle fences back home. And uh, all there were hundreds of people behind this fence. Uh, skeletons looked like thin, all, all of them were very thin. And uh, so one of the guys got out and uh, opened the gate, blew open the gate, shut up the gate. And by that time, we had dismounted and gotten outside. And uh, Lieutenant Burns went inside the gate and he saw a bunch of bodies and all these people crowding around us. Uh, some of them were crying, some of them were hugging our feet and down around our legs. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know what was going on. We had no idea of, of, uh, of camp like this. We had not seen any before. We hadn't, at that time, we hadn't even heard of these other camps that some of the other uh, Army divisions had liberated or experienced. The side road had a you know, railroad along it, and there were 10 boxcars there that were full of, had about 100 uh, Holocaust victims in each of the cars. The, large, the guards had abandoned them. Um, the, uh, as well as the train engineers. But the, somehow or other, I don't know how the doors of the, the boxcars got open, but so the, um, the people uh, who were already dead, I, th I would say about two thirds of the people in the boxcars were dead. So they just shoved them out of the boxcars and made it kind of like a ramp so that they, they, there was uh, uh, they, those who were still alive who were so weak you know, could crawl over them and eventually get up to the road. The grass was gone, the bark off the trees was gone. So there was nothing left unless you found some worms on the ground. That's the only thing they could eat. Like, I found on the fifth day or sixth day, I found some snails under a tree. And I, you know, I didn't have the strength to chew them. So I swallowed most of them. And then they crawled around my stomach for a whole day and a whole night. I was hitting my stomach trying to think I'm gonna kill them. It wasn't that way. But this is what people did. When the German SS troops guarding the concentration camp at Gunskirchen heard the Americans were coming, they suddenly got busy burying the bodies of their victims, or rather having them buried by inmates, and gave the prisoners who were still alive what they considered an extremely liberal food ration. One lump of sugar per person and one loaf of bread for every seven persons. Then. Two days or a day and a half before we arrived, the SS left. All this I learned from talking to the inmates of the camp, many of whom spoke English. Driving up to the camp in our Jeep, Corporal Despain and I first knew we were approaching the camp by the hundreds of starving, half-crazed inmates lying the roads begging for food and cigarettes. Many of them had been able to get only a few hundred yards from the gate before they keeled over and died. As weak as they were, the chance to be free, the opportunity to escape was so great they couldn't resist, though it meant staggering only a few yards before death came. Every generation in the United States is going to have its position to uh, defend the freedoms, to make up their mind whether they want to continue the freedoms we enjoyed as a result of the revolution, or do they want to squander 
and you know, every generation is going to be tested. There's always somebody out there, someplace, who will test us, whether it's Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein. There's always somebody around that's going to arise and um, you know, pose a threat to, that, to our way of life. They see our way of life as, as a, you know, a threat.